continue to progress and learn about and think about and, and apply the passing game to your own particular needs, the next step, of course, is dealing with personnel. And in this case, we want to talk about the quarterback, talk about the kind of person we're looking for at the quarterback position, and, and then also talk about the receiver. Now, we've talked all during this tape about the fact that the offensive system is a product of the personnel. And that's never more apparent than in the quarterback position. Because the quarterback, who your quarterback is, what his skills are, what he does well, are going to determine the type of pass game that you use. And I think most coaches make a tremendous error in trying to stuff a quarterback into a particular passing system. Because if the quarterback does not have the talent to throw a particular type of pass, then you're, you're not going, no matter how much time you spend, going to get the profitable results out of the quarterback who may lack in a certain area. So again, the system is going to be a reflection. OK, now we have a quarterback, or we have two quarterbacks. We have to determine what their strengths are. And, and a lot of times, you don't find that out until you practice, until you, you, don't, you don't put it into play by throwing the ball at a tire. The old days, we used to have quarterback drills where the quarterback would throw at a tire, or he'd throw at a man, or he'd throw high or throw low. Our opinion is that the only way to evaluate a quarterback is to give him the system, give him some plays, and then see if he can make the necessary decisions and perform and get the job done. Now, what are you looking for in a quarterback? Well, you're looking for intelligence. The number one quality, probably, of a quarterback is a certain amount of intelligence, and it's football intelligence. It's not necessarily the guy that's got a, a straight A average in the classroom. It's, it's a young man with football intelligence. And that means someone that can take the system, understand the coach's philosophy, understand what the rest of the team is doing, and then perform and make the right decisions to be successful. And that's critical. The second quality of a quarterback, of course, is leadership. You've got to have leadership as a quarterback. When the quarterback is in the huddle, those other 10 men depend on him. The coach can only give him the play and only get him started. The quarterback, through his own leadership, and remember, that's how you react to adversity, too not just making a great play. It's when, when somebody drops a pass. How do you, as a quarterback, help that guy get over the feeling that he just let the rest of the team down? So leadership, and that's not only positive leadership, but what to do when things aren't going well. And that's probably the second most important quality of a quarterback. Then the third one is, is what I call minimizing key big errors. And, and just think about that one for a minute. Not eliminating. No one is perfect in football or in life or anything else. So you want to find a quarterback that can minimize these key big errors. Now, what are key big errors? Well, one's a penalty. And of course, a penalty can happen real quick for a quarterback. If he doesn't get the play, he doesn't get it off, doesn't get the thing set. And that is a quarterback's responsibility. So that's a key big error that a quarterback has to minimize. The second thing he's got to minimize, of course, is a, is a bad play or a bad pass. And again, those are just, those are things that, again, he's going to minimize them and keep them to, again, try not to be a product of a bad play. The third thing, of course, is to eliminate or minimize a sack as a quarterback. If you're a quarterback, you want to understand the passing game and not be involved in a sack if you can possibly help it. Sometimes you have to. And then, of course, the fourth and most important key big area for a quarterback that he's got to minimize, and that is, of course, throwing the interception. Remember, back when we started this tape, one of the first things we talked about about this style of offense is that we have to be a high completion percentage offense and throw a low percentage of interceptions. If we can do that, if we can throw a low percentage of interceptions, passing will be successful and we will win the turnover battle and we will be successful. Other than that, in a quarterback, you, you hope he's got a good arm. But there's a million types of quarterbacks with a million types of arms. And, and I, I think as a quarterback, you'd make a real error in judgment if you try to mess around with your quarterback's arm. Let him throw, see what he can throw, analyze what he can throw, and then use the things that he can, that he can do. Anticipation is a key word for a quarterback. Anticipation. When a quarterback's back throwing the ball, he not only has to know what the receiver's doing, but he has to anticipate where he's going to throw that ball. That's going to be very, very important. Because where he throws the ball, we'll talk about later receiver spots. In other words, where you throw the ball to a receiver probably is, the, probably is a heck of a lot more important than what kind of an arm the guy has and a lot of other things that go along with it. So again, very important. 
The last thing for a quarterback, he's, it, it helps if he's got touch. If he doesn't have touch, then obviously uh, you can develop it. But most quarterbacks have a certain amount of velocity. Some have a good co uh, combination of touch with velocity. You're just looking for some combination, and that'll help you. Then the last thing, of course, is can the guy convert? Can the quarterback convert the critical downs and get the team in the end zone? That, again, is the end result. So you're looking for a certain amount of football IQ. You're certain lo looking for leadership. And then you're looking for a guy that can convert the critical down and move the ball down and get the team in the end zone. So that's very, very, very important. Now, we've also been talking throughout this tape about the, about the fact that offense and pass offense is an educational process. In other words, it's a process. It's not the coach telling the player what to do or the coach intimidating the player into doing something that he thinks is right. That's how some people operate. The way to operate within a successful pass offense is for the coach and the players to both participate and all participate in the forming of an offense and working together to make the offense successful. And the one word that, that is critical is confidence. If a player does not have confidence in what he's doing, then he'll never perform the skills that we're going to ask him to do. So it's very, very important that when the coach and the offense and all, everyone involved begins to develop this, this philosophy that everyone works together and understands what's going on. That is very, very important. The other thing that I think is important with the quarterback and the coach is being known for something. Yeah, everything in life, I think, is critical if you're known for something. Not just, well, we throw or we run or we're tough. Or we're, but you should begin to develop a philosophy on offense re relative to the passing game on what we're going to be known for. But what are we going to be known for in our passing game in our particular situation? And this will come as you learn about your team, as you learn what the skills are and exactly where you're going to progress. In other words, are we all on the same page? If we're all on the same page, coaches, players, and everyone involved, we have a chance to move forward and be successful. Okay, reviewing. We're going to be high percent, right? We're going to be a high percent passing team. We're going to be a low interception. We're not going to tolerate those kind of things. We're not going to tolerate interception. We're not going to tolerate a player or a part of our team that does not understand how important it is to have a high percentage of completion. Then we're going to have, remember, timing. Remember the word timing. Timing comes back and will continue to come back through this whole lecture of the timing of the quarterback being ready to throw, and when he's ready to throw, the receiver is ready to catch the ball. And on the other hand, when the receiver is ready to catch the ball, the quarterback has to be ready. So whenever we're discussing our pass offense, we're talking about timing. And when a coach says timing, that means that sometimes, based on what happens, receivers have to break routes off sooner, quarterbacks have to be ready quicker, or whatever the situation is, because timing is the key to pass offense. In other words, I'm ready when he's ready, and when he's ready, I'm ready, and vice versa. So timing is very, very critical, and we have to understand that. Now, the next point, and we're discussing quarterbacks now, but we're discussing the involvement of an offense and the relationship's going to build what we're going to be known for. It's very important that the quarterback and coaches understand the strengths of the offensive team. This is critical. In other words, the quarterback and the coach have to sit down and discuss the players that they are going to be responsible for. Because it doesn't do any good to, to hope that the coach understands that this tight end is a good receiver but not a good blocker, or that this receiver can catch but can't run real fast, or that this back can run but can't catch. And if, if you don't have that kind of communication and, and, and sort of almost a, an affection within your coaching staff and your, and your quarterback, you're going to miss something. Because there's going to be, the chips are going to be down on a third down or in a particular down and distance. And you're going to have to count on that player to make the big play for it. The coach can call the play. The quarterback can make it happen. But if, if you're not understanding or don't have a feel for your personnel and what makes them tick, then you have maybe a chance that you're going to miss something along the way. And that's very, very critical. Next thing, and again, we're talking about quarterback building. Quarterbacks have to have a, an appreciation of two things. Number one, blitzes. Quarterbacks have to understand blitz. 
and it's important that the quarterback understand that there's two types of blitzes. One is a secondary blitz. Okay, and the other one is a front blitz. And as we talked about previously in this tape, we talked about the fact that when we line up, we can find an alignment ratio. We will find an alignment ratio based on the formation that we deploy. If we have a one-back formation, we are dictating a 6-5 ratio in alignment of the defense. If not, then we have got a tremendous advantage. If we're in a two-back offense, we are dictating a 7-4 ratio, or else we have created an advantage in our situation. And we'll have to remind yourself of those ratios, because they're critical. Now, if we talk about a 6-5 ratio, or a 7-4 ratio, the second number are the secondary. These are the secondary people, based on our formation. And if any one of those people blitz the quarterback has to understand how to take advantage of that. So if anyone in the secondary ratio blitzes at any time during a particular offensive play, no matter what the play is, the quarterback has to know what to do. And basically, and we'll get into it as we go through each individual round, but basically all receivers have to be aware of the secondary ratio, and if one of those people blitzes, they have to look for a hot pass. It's very, very simple. Very simple. If we take an offensive play here, this is a, a two-back attack. We were demanding a 7-4 ratio. So seven men are going to be in here playing some sort of run defense or alignment defense. There's going to be four people back here responsible for the secondary. If any one of those four men were to blitz, any one of these four men were to sneak up and blitz, those receivers just have to turn and be alert for a hot pass. And again, we'll get into a heck of a lot more detail in this. But a quarterback has to understand that because, he, again, remember, one of his objectives is to minimize key big errors. Well, a, the keyest, biggest error that can ha possibly happen to you is a quarterback who's not knowledgeable of what can happen when a blitz takes place from a secondary defender. And that will break down and lose people's confidence. Remember our confidence level? As soon as it's second down and 15, now no matter how much you believe in yourself, there's a certain lack of confidence that comes when you, a mistake has been made. And all that mistake was made was in preparation. Because if the quarterback understands the secondary blitz concept, at least he can throw the ball up in the stand. Because that's, and then at least it's second down and 10, and you've got a chance to continue whatever you're doing and, and at least punt the ball, play defense, and win the game and win the turnover battle. So again, blitz understanding by a quarterback is critical to the performance of the pass game when we get into each individual round. Okay, so let's take a look at it. We, that's a 6-5 ratio. I mean, that's, excuse me, a 7-4 ratio. If we get into the 6-5 ratio, which are, we assume that a, a one-back formation will dictate. There'll be six guys in here somewhere. They'll take this other guy. There'll be a guy out in here somewhere. And then there'll be a corner, a safety, a corner, excuse me, a corner, and then a guy here. So now we've got a five. We've got a six-five ratio. And the quarterback has to know based on protection that again, if any one of these guys come and blitz, he has to be able to throw a hot pass out to a receiver who's also aware that that is something different than the normal style of defense. These people, because of our, our formation, we'll let them play six in here. They can line them up any way they want to line them up. We're going to force them to put a guy out here because that's just what the formation dictates. If they don't put a guy out here, they can't play. So again, if they play what we feel they should play, these five people become secondary defenders, and that blitz is critical, and the understanding is important. Okay? Now, again, we'll go ahead and do it in each individual route, so don't worry about exactly what it means, but right now, it's important to know secondary blitz. Now, the other important blitz understanding for a quarterback is, of course, the front blitzes. And the front blitz blitzes are extremely important. Extremely important that he understands a universal alignment. A 
the universal alignment is like this. Now again, very honestly, if they're playing an 8-3 ratio, we think, we've, we're, we, think we, we have a tremendous advantage. And I think we can give you some information here that I don't think they can play it. And that's, I don't normally make flat statements because someone's going to get another piece of chalk and say, well, wait a minute, we can do it. But just say that this guy comes out of here, and, and so they are in a 7-4 ratio, right? They took, they've got a guy, they've got a corner here, and a safety here, and a corner here. And they either, this guy is either a rover or a backer, or if this guy is a rover and this guy's a backer. In other words, four of these guys become the 7-4 ratio, which they have to have, in our opinion, against two-back football. And so again, if any one of these guys comes, he becomes a secondary blitz man. But now the problem that the quarterback has is now they've got a lot of potential in here to blitz inside and to have a front blitz and the quarterback has to know what to do. And again, we'll get into the specific protections later on, but he has to understand that any combination in here of these kind of people coming, these kind of people coming, what, however they decide to deploy, that the quarterback has to realize that he may have to be alert and an alert may mean that he could hit a receiver because this guy blitzes and he could hit him and make a big play even though the man is being blocked by somebody. So understanding that when this 7-4, when, you know, when they start raising heck with you and they start, you got to have a mechanism. And the quarterback will have two mechanisms, either an alert inside or a specific hot. It's the same way as he does out here. In other words, obviously, if all seven of these guys came, we've got five blockers, and we've got two backs, we've got seven. We've got a fighting chance here, don't we? So we've actually got them all blocked, but the great quarterback who understands the concept, will, he won't even wait for the hot to happen. He'll feel this guy blitz. He'll know this guy's out here. He'll know that he's got an inside route like a shallow cross or an option, and he'll just take the ball and whoop and give it to him. And you'll be amazed at how, how down the line, all of a sudden, this guy won't blitz anymore. Because he can't afford to blitz unless they do what? Make a departure from the coverage and stick a man over here and stick men all over the place. And then, of course, you now have another advantage. You now know what the defense is going to do, and you can take advantage of it. So again, let me review that quickly, because the blitz concept is going to come through the, our entire lecture here. We have to know the secondary. We have to know that when any of those guys come, we have to throw a hot. We have to throw it. In other words, if it's a 4, 7, 4, 6, 5, any of those guys blitz, we don't have them blocked. It's that simple. And of course, if you get into an 8-3, which a lot of times happens at the high school level, an 8-3 and some of those guys come, you're going to be throwing hot a lot. Or you're going to have to design the kind of pass offense that gets away from the pressure of an 8-3 alignment. The, the front blitz, which we're talking about, the, this is where the quarterback begins to grow. He begins to, to mature because he understands who's blocked, but he also knows that he can sometimes, just by just knowing the game and knowing his receivers and knowing what the defense is trying to do, he can either use an alert, which is just, a, just cheating, basically, just popping that thing to a man who's ready, or if he knows that it's, a, it's something that can't be blocked for whatever reason, then he has a pure hot principle to an inside man if an eighth man comes, and it'll be a combination of a secondary blitz and a front blitz. So really important concepts that a quarterback understands as he goes along. And, and maybe emphasize a, a key point, and that's being known for something. I think, it's, I think it's important when you mention something like that to be very specific. Uh, through the years, for instance, the Oakland Raiders were known as a deep passing football team. And I think you knew that. When, whenever you played the Oakland Raiders, and now, of course, the Los Angeles Raiders, they were going to throw the ball deep. They were going to put tremendous pressure on you and put tremendous pressure on your secondary. So they were known as a deep passing, big play offensive football team. I think the Washington Redskins right now are, are a team that's known as, for a complete pass game. Uh, in other words, they have a variety of pass actions. They, have, uh, they use a lot of formations. Uh, they they complement their actions with a draw, the screen, the shovel pass, and a, a variety. So 
you can't just zero in on a particular formation or on a particular past concept. They basically got a, 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 a wide variety. Then the third very obvious example is ball control passing, known as a ball control high percentage passing team. And of course, that's been a lot of my background. Uh, that's why we keep referring to, to the high percentage of completions and low interception. Of course, that's the, the graphic example. That's the San Francisco 49ers. In other words, they, they are a ball control passing team that doesn't make a lot of mistakes and it just continues to move the ball down the field with the use of the pass and, and, and very successful. So now we're still developing the quarterback and talking about what he has to understand. And, and as we go into this and as we get ready to, to discuss the individual routes, the quarterback has to begin to understand those routes. And remember, we've talked all during this lecture about what kind of a route, categories of passes. In other words, are they short passes? Are they intermediate passes or are they deep passes? A quarterback has to know that. He has to know the concept of the pass. If it's a short passing game, then he has to know that we're trying to put two people in one zone to, to, to make a successful play, or we're trying to put three people in two zones. And if you remember the defensive zone theory, the 6-4-3 defensive zone concept in breaking the defensive field into six short zones, four intermediate zones, and three deep zones, the quarterback has to have an understanding because he has to know where his receivers are going to be deployed. He also has to have an understanding if, if it's an intermediate pass. To me, the biggest problem in passing the football today is attacking the intermediate zones between 12 and 20 yards and being successful in that area. And that is that it's an easy area to, to defend. It's a tough area to throw because there's more time for people to react to the thrown ball and it's tougher to be successful. As we get in, and we've talked about the subject before, we've talked about our horizontal zones, that horizontal zone between 12 and 20, we've got to throw in that zone. And we've also talked about the vertical seams, those vertical seams that go up through that intermediate zone. So as we create our pass offense, as we find out what our talent can do, we've got to find people that can run routes in that horizontal zone laterally, and we've got to find people that can run vertical routes up through that 12 to 20 yard zone and so we can throw the ball because that's, that's a key area. And if we can't throw those, we're going to be dinking the ball all the time and we're going to have a lot of short passes which are going to be very successful, but we have to, there have to be too many successful plays in succession to make yourself a 70 or 80 yard drive and that makes it pretty darn tough. Okay, now, we're getting there. Defensive preparation is the key. Remember this, the quarterback now has to know and understand defenses. And we've got several basic coverages that we're going to talk about. I just want to show them simply so that we can make sure that we're on the same page as we discuss individual routes here. And people call them all sorts of different things, but it, it really doesn't make any difference what you call them. But if you have a three deep safety, two corners, two corners, and a rover, that is, and they play zone, they play some sort of zone, cover this right, this, we call this cover three. And we will be talking about cover three during, as we get into each pass route. And that'll be important that we understand. There are certain routes that, that, that will be good. The, the, the ratio here, as we talk about it, will be a 4-4-3. Remember our pass rush ratio. There'll be a linebacker here, a linebacker here, and there'll be this, and then there'll be four guys up here rushing. There'll be some guys, four guys rushing somewhere, four guys in the short zones, and there'll be three guys in the deep zone. And that gives us our 4-3 four, four, pass rush ratio. That's, that's a key, key coverage. The second one is cover two. And cover two will have a four, five, two ratio. There'll be four guys in here in some form rushing. There'll be five guys here playing the short or intermediate zone, the short zone. So we'll have a four, five, two ratio. And we will work, that's cover two and you'll see, we'll develop our pass game against cover two. Now, the other coverage along with this that's becoming a universal coverage now is cover two man. And this is one that the quarterback has to understand because this is the one that they get you on because this guy locks on here, 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 and these two guys just play center field. And it is virtually, I mean, it's, it, and depending on the kind of route you do, it's hard to throw routes under here that are oriented towards zone because the guy's playing man. 
And it's hard to throw the ball in here when a guy's got man and he's got a guy backed up behind him to protect him. So it's really important. So we will, as in all of our routes now that we develop along the way, we will try to show you how to run them against cover two man as well as cover three and against as well as cover two. The last coverage that we, we see and we want to make sure that we understand as quarterbacks and coaches, of course, is just pure man coverage. Pure man coverage. It's a little harder to see in two back football, but we have to try to find it. And that's where the safety comes over here and locks up on this guy. The corner comes over here and locks up on this guy. This corner comes over and locks up here. Now, there's two types of what we call cover one, but we're probably gonna, we're gonna just discuss the main one, which is just pure cover one, where the free safety comes up and locks up on him. There's a cover one and there's also a cover one free where the backers come in here and take and do some things on these guys. They banjo these guys. In other words, this backer can take him if he goes out. This backer will take him if he comes in. This same way over here. Or they can all blitz. They can all blitz except one of these backers who has to cover him. They can all come at you, and you've got to know what to do. But again, we, as we develop our pass game, we, ha we have to be simple enough. And the quarterback has to be understanding and intelligent enough so that he can handle all these things. Because if he can handle all these things, then we are going to be successful and the receivers are going to know what to do and, they will, and people will not be one step ahead of you. And that is very, very important. Okay, now, next. And this is where we start getting into the preparation. How do we get this thing organized? Well, we've got some pre-snap preparation for the quarterback. This is where it all starts now. Can we do it? What's the secret to the pass game? Let me tell you what I think about the pass game and why we've developed it to such an art that we think it's as good as any type of run game. The best running game in football is option football, running. You know why? Because running the option takes advantage of the defense after the snap of the ball. In other words, when you, when you put an option running game in, and if I was to coach running game only, it would be totally based on option football, option running. Because I run down, if this guy tackles me, I pitch it to this guy. If this guy doesn't take me, I do this. In other words, the option running game allows you, after the snap, to take advantage of defensive reactions and defensive assignments. So it's got to be the best form of running. Because all, all the rest of the running game is just running. You just run by guys, you try to beat guys, you try to, to, to run through them. The option allows decision making after the snap. Well, our pass game allows pre-snap decisions to be made by intelligent quarterbacks and coaches. It also makes after snap reactions and in our system it's going to allow us to take advantage of what the defense does after the snap. That's the whole key. Because if we can, if we can prepare ourselves before the snap to take advantage of some of this, because we're better prepared and we understand defenses, but then after the snap, if some of the plays that we have are adjustable and flexible to what the defense does, then we, def we have twofold success. We have the chance to be successful before the snap and we have success after. And I want to make that a clear point because there are people that don't believe that the passing game is functional enough to be successful because you're always one play behind the defense. You know, we ran it in and they, uh, they took it away. Now we ran it out, they took it away. Whoop, we ran deep, they were deep. We ran here, they were here. And if you don't have the understanding of the pass game and develop it from the ground up with a quarterback and the coaches, you'll never be able to get the success that you need. So this is why you better hang on because I'll tell you, if you can understand the pre-snap and after-snap preparation between the quarterback and the coaches and get prepared, you'll have a chance to be successful. Okay, what do we got pre-snap? Okay, pre-snap, first of all, we believe this. The quarterback should have the play signaled to him by the coach. We believe that. In other words, the quarterback should be out there, he's his own man, he should have a very subtle way of finding the signal from the coach. Not, not looking over here for a half hour while they're standing, but just, he just walks up to the side of the huddle, and he looks over, the coach gives him a real qu quick signal. And that is the play. And that is a signal, and it should be 
as simple a signal as possible so that the quarterback has to make as many decisions after he gets the signal as the, quarter, as the coach can allow him to do. In other words, the coach just says sprint. That's it. Now, the quarterback has to know what hash he's on. He has to know what formation he's in. And he has to go in there and tell those other 10 guys what in the heck to do. And of course, if the coach wants a specific formation, then he sends the formation in. Don't get me wrong. But the co the, the, pl the this puts the, see, people are critical of coaches calling plays. But I'm not, that to me is takes the pressure off the player. The player can get up, shake the cobwebs out, and he can, like I say, look over there and the coach can give him the shot. And then he is accountable, as I said, to deploy the formation in such a way so that that play can be successful. Okay, now, wh what other ways can we help this quarterback to, to take charge? Well, we could have a no huddle, right? We could have a no huddle. Why not? This puts more, again, we're, remember what we're trying to do now. We're trying to get this quarterback and, 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 and reinforce his leadership and make him accountable and more understanding of what the heck's going on. That, co that guy... Can, we could have some no huddle play. And then he just goes up, no huddle right, no huddle right, and now he's got to come up under there. And what is he beginning to do now? He's beginning to do the things that we've talked about. He's beginning to look at the alignment keys. He's beginning to look at alignment ratios. He's beginning to analyze what the defense is trying to do pre-snap, and it puts him in a more commanding role. And that is important because, again, the quarterback is the guy that's got to get the job done. Now, a third mechanism for the quarterback and coach to uh, effectively get started would be the use of what we call a check with me. Now, a check with me is just exactly what it says. The quarterback goes into a huddle, gives two plays, And he says, check with me. In other words, now the players, the, all 10 of them, have an idea that we're going to say, let's just say we have a, a rip and a liz. A rip is to the right sprint, and a liz is to the left. OK, and the quarterback goes into the huddle and says, rip and liz, check with me. And now the quarterback is going to be told to evaluate a, some alignment key. Maybe it's the rover. And he is going to be told, whenever that, if that rover's here, you check and go the other way. Very simple. He can do this in an alignment. Let's say a team has an alignment that is, they get overshifted. They get overshifted. You can come up here and you can say, quick toss, check with me. Quick toss. And of course, the quarterback comes up and says, holy cow, and he says, left, whatever your system is, and you run the quick toss around the left. So again, this is another method of putting the quarterback in charge of the game, but not having the initial pressure of the play selection based on down and distance and situation, all the things we've talked about. OK, now the next area is, of course, automatic. You have to have an automatic system. You have to. And it can be simple. Because again, the, remember what we're developing. We're developing the chance for the quarterback to be prepared or to take advantage of the defense even before the ball is snapped. So now a simple automatic system, and there's many of them that could be used, where you have a live color. In other words, a live color is a very good system. In other words, the live color this week is blue. So the quarterback comes up, and no matter what your cadence is, says blue. Everyone now is alert to the fact that that play will be changed. And again, it just gives the quarterback a chance to get out of a bad play into a good play and again, perform all the objectives of a quarterback. High percentage, low interception, eliminate the bad play. All the things that a quarterback wants to be known for are going to be helped within this area. OK, now the last thing pre-snap, and this is related as we get to the pass game, is the quarterback's ability to understand coverages and develop our initial pass concept on site, which is called a look. OK? The look is merely a poor defensive adjustment to a formation. And it is a simple, it's like, it's like 
is throwing the ball out to a guy. You can get a team. This is a formation. This is an exaggerated type of formation. But many times you'll put a formation up like this, and let's say the team wants to play cover two. They got here, and they are not. They have no idea what they're going to do with this guy right here. And so consequently, the quarterback has the ability to come up to the line. Again, a pre-snap adjustment and a chance to get something going. He just looks at his buddy. The guy knows. He looks back. You can, a lot of people grab face masks. They put, there's, all, there's all sorts of signals. We just call it a look. I look out here. He's open. Before the ball's even snapped, I mean, obviously, you've got to snap it. He's going to throw that ball out to this guy, and he's on his way. Another graphic example of it. And this is why you have to be, as you're thinking, as you're listening to me talk, as you're thinking about what you're going to do in your system, that's all I care about is helping you. This is why you've got to examine multiple formations so that you can get an advantage on a guy that's not well prepared. A tremendous example of it is in a, in a one-back formation like this. Of oftentimes, people will play cover three like this, and that's the extent of their coverage. So where's the look? The look is right here. This guy doesn't have to do anything but look at his buddy, stand there, he throws the ball right here, he runs for four yards, and he's got second and six. You're in the normal down, and we got a chance to be successful. And you'll find that, that that'll happen more times than it won't because people are not willing, willing to cover that. Well, if they do cover him, they might jump up in a cover two and go here, and now this guy won't know where to come out here. He won't know what to do. So now, all of a sudden, you get the look right here. And you have a chance to make a, a cheap play and take advantage of a poor defensive adjustment. OK, now, that's, better, that's preparation for pre-snap. We've got a lot of things we can do. We can let the quarterback now. Let me just tell you one I didn't even think about, that just how my mind works. How about just say, hey, you call it, partner. In other words, what's wrong with a coach just saying, it's your turn? And so again, we could just have the quarterback had come in there, and again, all this is doing what? It's developing understanding, it's developing confidence with your quarterback, and it's giving him a chance to control the game as it starts, okay? Again, super, I think, because of the fact that you, a good share of the time, you will have already taken advantage of the alignment key, which we discussed, right? And you'll have all the, already taken a, a, a line, you'll al already taken a, advantage of the alignment ratio because of your knowledge of exactly what is going on when you get to the line of scrimmage. And then when you begin to take the snap, and you've already evaluated these things and looked here, when you take the snap, now you're going to be better prepared to execute. OK, now let's take a look at after the snap. And hopefully now. If all these other things are in sync, if, if the quarterback has profited from his pre-snap preparation, his evaluation, maybe changing the play, a check with me, an automatic, now once the ball is snapped, he has to have faith that the system's going to take over. The passing system now goes into full effect. Because as we talked about before, and if you remember the categories of passes, most of the passes that we're going to develop are passes that are going to react to and convert to the defense. In other words, we are going to try now to take advantage of what the defensive do defense does after the snap of the ball. So the quarterback, once he's gotten to the snap, he's got about two things left to do, and then the rest of it is a team, team effort. Because now the receivers have to convert their routes. The people have to know how to take advantage of what the defense does, where they're deployed, what their assignments are. And then I think you have a chance to be successful. And then, of course, you don't, you don't do the bad things. You eliminate the bad plays. Again, success is, is eminent as far as I'm concerned. OK, what does a quarterback do on the snap? Well, now remember, what's his first thing? He better know what to do against blitz. That's his number one thing. Once he's if he hasn't changed it, once he's stuck with a play, once he's doing with, with what, going with what he has, he now has to have confidence that the only thing he has to worry about is execution except for the blitz. And remember our blitz concept. If one of those secondary come, once he knows what the ratios are, once he knows what the alignment is, if one of those secondary people comes, he has to throw his hot receiver out there. Okay? If, if the inside seven, inside eight, 
inside six, whatever he determines or whatever the coach determines is the front. If they blitz, stunt, cause some sort of action in there, the quarterback has to know what to do. He either has to throw an alert, as we talked about, an alert to somebody who would be available because he understands what the defense is trying to do, or he throws a pure hot because he's just so outnumbered. We're only protecting three men on one side, they bring four. We're protecting four on this side, they bring five. I mean, there are all sorts of alignments that don't fit into little categories. So the quarterback on the snap of the ball has to know what to do with blitz. And, if, and again, because if hopefully he knows what to do with blitz because he reads it before the snap. Because the formation will allow him to read the blitz before the snap and then he won't even worry about it. Just automatic and beat the blitz prior to the snap. I keep repeating myself because, like I say, there's no cure-all for a tough blitz after the snap. It's just don't let them get you in a bad situation. Know what the defense is and try to get rid of the ball as fast as you can. Okay, after he beats the blitz or is aware of and does not allow the blitz to affect his execution, now the quarterback has one thing to do, and that's know where his movement key or movement keys are for the particular play. And we'll get in as we get into the individual routes, and we're going to go into those in just a second in our training session, our route training session we will show you where the movement keys are. And the nice thing about it, the movement keys will be very simple. They're simple. They're not a bunch of guys. You don't look from one safety to one this to this. You look in the area that you're going to throw. If it's a short pass, you look at the movement key in the short zone you're going to throw in. If it's a deep route, you're going to look deep. If it's an intermediate route, you're going to evaluate the people that defend the intermediate route. Okay, now, I want to move from quarterbacks just into receivers generally. And then we'll go into our, into our route training session. But receivers generally, what are we looking for? Well, basically, we, there's two types of receiver routes. One is a disciplined receiver route with a predetermined junction point. And whenever the coach gives a receiver a predetermined junction point route, the receiver has to get to that position. If he says, I want a 14-yard square in, that receiver has to attempt to go to 14 yards to make the square in so that the timing of the pass is going to be there. If he gets deviated from his route, then he's got to work back to that junction point, and then if he can't get to 14 in the predetermined time, he's got to make it off at 12 because he knows that going around that guy took him a couple of seconds, and if I go to 14, I break down the pass offense timing. And remember what timing is. I'm ready when he's ready. He's ready when I'm ready. So again, the receiver has two types of routes. They're either disciplined. I want to hook at 10. I want to post it at 4. I want to uh, hitch at 6. I want to this at Those are predetermined, disciplined, junction point routes. To me, they're a, a dying breed in football today because they don't fit into any of the things that we've been talking about, and that's taking advantage of the defense after the ball snap. If you say you're going to draw four or five junction points on the field, the defense just has to get in the way of those things, and then what are you going to do? You are, you are not going to be able to function. So what are we looking for, and what is the number one ingredient for a receiver? It's the ability to convert routes based on what the receiver sees. Whether it's man, whether it's zone, whether it's two man, whether it's cover one, Whatever it is, the re your receiver you're looking for is the receiver that knows coverages and that can convert the route so that, as we talked about, we can have as good a pass offense as the option game is to the running game because we can take advantage of the defense. If the defense is playing zone, we'll run a zone route. If he's playing man, we're going to run a man route. If he's got some other combination, we're going to try to show that guy how to do it. That's really important so that the receiver has to know man and zone he has to have an understanding of defense just like the quarterback does. He has to understand timing, right? He has to know timing. If the receiver was told to go to eight and he can't get to eight in a prescribed period of time, he's got to stop at four or five or six because that QB is when he's ready. No, nothing's going to disrupt him unless he has to throw a blitz pass. Nothing's going to disrupt the quarterback's timing. He's going to get back in three or five or seven steps, and he's going to be ready. And, and a lot of times that line is not going to be able to hold him out long enough for him to throw, wait five minutes. And the quarterback doesn't want to sit there waiting for the, for the receiver. So the receiver's got to understand the timing just as well as everyone else. 
Okay, another important ingredient for a receiver, of course, is, is release. And this is important for all receivers, not just tight ends or, or wide receivers, but all receivers have to know how to release. It may be a prescribed arc that they release, it may be a direction that they release, and along with the release, they have to know the stem. They have to know the approach to their particular route. And I think sometimes receivers forget that and they, and they think that, well, I just run a route. Well, you have to run a route smartly so that you can determine man or zone because the whole key to this thing is going to be to convert your route so that we can be successful after the snap with our pass off in. So you release, you have a pre-described stem, and then the key ingredient for a receiver is learning how to run a route on a man. And you run a route on a man in both zone and man. If this man was a receiver, and he was running a, a route, and you had two people down here like this, you just put two backers out here, and you told him to run the route on a man, you told him to run, he would, uh, he, you have to tell him which man. <laughs> he runs the route at this man. If this man is dropping in zone, then he runs the route on the man until the time that he is supposed to be ready for the pass, whatever the timing is of your pass route. So if this guy stops here, does this, if he's in zone, you run the route on the man, and then you come away. And of course, the quarterback will know what the receiving spot is, where to throw the ball, how to make the most effective use of that receiver by hitting him where he's got a chance to be successful. If the receiver is running the route on the man, and the man is right here, then he's got to release, he's got to come up. If this guy's playing man, then he has to know how to convert that route into a man route. But all receivers, wide receivers, backs, tight ends, everybody has to understand the concept of running the route on the man. And to me, how you run the route on the man is, first of all, you get as centered up as straight as you can on the guy, as fast as you can, so that he doesn't know what you're going to do. That's the key. Break the cushion. That's the whole key to running routes anyway, is break the cushion. Now, if he won't let you break the cushion, and you have to stop because the time's up, then you have obviously created the distance that you need so that you can be successful. Because obviously a wide receiver running a route on a man, if the guy's way down here, you have got to run a release and come at that guy as effectively and as smoothly as you can. And the other thing for a wide receiver, it's not how fast you are, believe me. Wide receivers, it's great if you have a guy that's fast, but he's either fast or he's not fast. Wide receivers have to be fluent. They have to be smooth. What you're looking for in a wide receiver is a release and a stem and then a smooth, consistent, fluid speed so this guy doesn't know what you're doing. If you go like this and then all of a sudden go like that, he knows that you're going to make a break. So you have to be able to run the route on the man and know what that means to be successful in our pass game. The other, another quality for a receiver is avoid. You have to know how to avoid. Receivers. Any receiver has to know what to do when this guy is standing in your path and you want to go to here. You can't run like that because you have now thrown off all the timing. You have taken this poor quarterback is sitting back there waiting for you to get to point A over here and you're already over here somewhere. It's impossible. So avoiding for a receiver, knowing how to make this guy think you're going here and then come here and then get back on. Those are the things that are going to be important as we convert these routes because the quarterback is depending on the receivers to do it. Okay, quarterbacks no receiving spots. Receivers no receiving spots. Quarterbacks no throwing spots. In other words, every receiver should know where the quarterback's throwing the ball. Is he throwing it five yards behind the center? Is he rolling out behind the guard? Is he throwing it five yards outside the tackle? Those are throwing spots, and you'd be amazed at how many receivers have no clue where the receiving, where the throwing spot's gonna be, and then let alone where the reception or receiving spot should be for a particular receiver. All critical things. Last point for receivers, nice if they have hands, that's probably as important an ingredient as they should, and having the consistent speed and the fluid motion as we talked about, and again, having an understanding of the pass game. Okay, now we're ready for the next point, and we are now going to draw some pass plays, and we call it our route training session. And the route training session is merely going to be an examination of seven or eight particular methods of throwing the ball against the defenses that we've talked about up here and how we take a play and hopefully at the snap make it a successful play by putting all the ingredients that we've talked about through this lecture, 
all the ingredients from the very first educational process to the understanding of defense, to the movement keys, to the alignment keys, to the route conversion, to the short pass, intermediate pass, deep pass, all those things now that are spinning around in your head are going to come together as we examine every single route and determine what the concept is, what category it's in, and what we're trying to get out of each particular pass that we call.